All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah, bismillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Uh, my praise and blessings uh, go upon the Prophet and upon the family of the Prophet, upon the companions of the Prophet. And uh, I pray that Allah sends uh, the praise and the favor and the blessings upon the Prophet and his family and the companions. Uh, inshallah, we uh, welcome you all back to our second session of uh, our series, Walking with the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi which is part of our 2022 summer sirah. Uh, so as you all know, as we covered last time in our first session, the structure of the series will essentially walk through narrations or a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and commentary from a compilation known as the Shama'il al-Tirmidhi. Uh, the Shama'il al-Tirmidhi, this version I have, is, is published by uh, uh, the Imam al-Ghazal, Institute, but there's so many different versions uh, in the syllabus of the series. I've linked a PDF version as well as uh, an online link. So these narrations are compiled by Imam at tirmidhi and they're accessible uh, through different kind of uh, mediums, and so you're welcome to draw from there. But uh, our series today draws entirely from that book, which I just uh, picked up. And um, we, inshallah, after kind of covering the different narrations of the specific topics, today we'll be talking about the modesty, the humility, and the character of the Prophet uh, and and the after part of kind of covering those narrations. Uh, people, whether you are alive on Facebook or whether you are joining us uh, here in the Zoom room, please feel free to just drop any kind of comments or any reactions you might have. Uh, I, I, you know, this is this is something I'd love to kind of hear from you all. What resonates with you? What questions you might have? And so we can kind of walk through it together. I, I, I emphasize again, I'm not. Uh, any sort of teacher or alim to, to instruct in anybody in this kind of course, but uh, to kind of walk along this experience of going with the Prophet so each of us can learn something from one another. Uh, and as we mentioned last time, we're not going to be going in order of the compilation of the book, but we'll be drawing from different portions in order to help appreciate not just who the Prophet was, but the experience of being around the Prophet So last time we began our walk, we, we uh, literally you know, put ourselves in, in the shoes of the seventh century Arabian society. And we said, all right, we're going to go for a walk with the Prophet ﷺ. We're literally walking with the Prophet ﷺ. What do we pick up? What, what kind of jumps to mind for us as we are walking with the Prophet ﷺ? So we talked about and noted his uh, moderate yet very striking appearance that, uh, you know, as well as his distinguishing features and general humility that was innate to his person. What, what did people kind of get struck about, um, about him and we narrated how one of his uh, companions actually related that if there were no revelations to come to the Prophet Sallam, we knew that there was something special about him just by who he was outwardly, by his character, by his appearance. And so uh, he was essentially a, a walking miracle in that sense. And so, you know, how it would manifest in everyday life is kind of what we talked about. And we then walked with the Prophet Sallam into a gathering uh, and we saw, we sat with him, we observed how he and his gatherings were for all those who were attending and how he was in those gatherings. And today we're going to continue our journey as we continue to walk with the Prophet Sallallahu We remind ourselves of these gatherings that we are in. So picture yourself, just if you close your eyes, whatever you need to do to imagine yourself, but you're in a gathering with the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Just think about what we talked about last time and we'll refresh our memory a little bit, but just pay attention to um, not just the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and how he interacts in these gatherings, but also the other people in the audience. Think about yourself and imagine yourself in that space. And so inshallah with that, we begin with a quick refresher of the gatherings of the Prophet So we related a hadith that was narrated in the uh, in, in the compilation by uh, Hassan ibn Ali. So kind of like the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu but the son of the Prophet Sallallahu cousin um, and brother-in-law Ali ibn Abi Talib um, and the, uh, you know, who would go on to be the fifth uh, Khalifa of, of Islam. And so uh, Hassan narrates that his, uh, his brother actually narrating. So he's like, I heard from my brother, uh, Hussein, Imam Hussein, the famous Imam Hussein, uh, may Allah uh, have mercy on them both, that he relates that then I asked him, Ali, his, his I being Hussein, I asked him, Ali, about the Prophet Sallallahu gatherings. And we remember that, the, that uh, Ali had lifted up for us that the Prophet Sallallahu would enter a gathering and he would walk in 
but he wouldn't take up any specific special space. He didn't have uh, a, a space at the head of the table. He didn't have, he didn't expect people to get up for him and then go to a, a specific space. And that is the process of some space. That's where he goes. And you would assume that a person of his stature, especially within the community and the society he's living in, that's kind of where he would go. But no, the Prophet, uh, the uh, Ali related that the Prophet would take whatever seat is available, whatever opening is available in that gathering, he would come and sit and he would instruct others to do so as well. He would instruct others that don't expect people to stand up for you. And he really disliked it when people would stand up for him. Um, he, he didn't see that as, as something that he wanted to do. He, he saw that as something distasteful. And so he, 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 said, he told people to stay seated. He said, stay seated wherever you are. I'll come and I'll sit with whoever with whoever's got some space next to them. And so just thinking about, again, psychologically, you may be uh, like this may be a, a gathering for the Prophet Sassam, in celebration of the Prophet Sassam. And so you may have, you know, all these different preparations, or you may have these expectations that this is the Prophet of Allah, this is the leader of our community, we've got to prepare the best space, but the Prophet Sassam walks into that space not thinking, where is my crown that I'm going to put on? Where is all these different things I'm going to put on? The Prophet Sassam walks into a room and says, wherever there's space, I will find it. I will sit there. Even if it's in the corner of the room and there's not enough space, I will sit there. And he advised his companions to do so as well. Uh, we also talked about in the gatherings that it wasn't just the Prophet would come to a gathering and busy himself with just his two or three friends that might be there or just, you know, stick to his clique or stick to his circle. And that's all that his experiences in the gathering. But what's striking is that each of the people that were sitting in that gathering, whether they're in the farthest corner or they were real close to him, they would get an equal share of his time and attention. And every, every one of them would feel as if they've been blessed by his presence, so much so that they would feel that they are the most beloved of the Prophet So just thinking about not only was he someone that walked into a gathering and expected uh, not to have like a, a throne put up for him or expected people to make way for him, but someone who just took space wherever he could find, but left that gathering, making sure that he was uh, in touch with each person, that each person felt his presence in the positive sense, that he would give a cheerful, smiling countenance to people, uh, that his good nature encompassed people such that they felt that he was like a father to them. Like he, th they could have been the most, uh, you know, random person in that gathering. They could have been a passerby, but they felt genuine connection with this human being that came into their gathering uh, and that it, they and as Ali relates that they became truly equal in his presence so there was no hierarchy or preference as I mentioned when we have our gatherings here uh, in, in our times when we have our friends over we probably will spend some time with the people who we know the most we might say hello hi goodbye you know to the people who are who are there who we might not get along with as well but it's so interesting that in these gatherings there was no favorite for the Prophet Sassam. The Prophet Sassam had his preferences. Obviously, he has his people who are closest to him, but everybody felt as if they were um, equal and as if they were as loved, if not most beloved, to the Prophet Sassam. And what's very interesting is that these gatherings were not just, you know, hot air. These gatherings were spaces where people could come. They were gatherings of knowledge. They were gatherings of patience and forbearance. They were gatherings of modesty, trust, and respect that voices weren't raised, people weren't arguing and shouting, or, you know, it, it wasn't very boisterous. There was no talk, ill talk of women, or ill talk of any kind of sanctities and disrespect in that regards. And people's shortcomings were not broadcasted. People weren't humiliated in different spaces. These were positive, uplifting gatherings. So they weren't just spaces where people would clown on each other and put other people down, trying to gain favor with the process. And they, they were talking about very positive things, that they were all equal with one another in that gathering gathering, yet they were just contending with each other in piety, in taqwa, uh, superior only on the basis of God consciousness or of taqwa. Uh, and they're humbly revealing, uh, revering those who are their elderly, and they were showing compassion to those who were young, and they would give preference to the needy, and they'd give, they would take care of the strangers. So just thinking about these gatherings, these gatherings, what it wasn't just another lunch party, it wasn't just, you know, another get together, these were very intentional gatherings, when it tells you that the randomest person in that gathering felt like the Prophet Sassam connected with them, even though they were on the opposite side of the room, it tells you that there was a lot of intentionality there, that there was no ill talk that was being given, that there was no kind of violation of sanctity. It tells you this was a very positive space, but what we talked about last time, and inshallah, what we'll talk about this time as well, is seeing that these weren't just gatherings that were solely occupied about religious matters. The Prophet Sassam's companions would talk about the, their, uh, their, the, the politics of their day. They would talk about their labors. They would talk about the, their 
food. They would talk about miscellaneous things. And what's very interesting, as we'll talk about, the Prophet ﷺ would talk to him about that stuff. They didn't feel the Prophet ﷺ would not relate to them uh, because of because of his status. But the Prophet ﷺ was one of them. He was he was among them, and he he would he would he would he would, he would be able to give his opinions and speak to them as well and meet them where they are. So what's very curious about this, very peculiar, uh, when we think about these gatherings, one thing should kind of stick out is that people came into uh, the gatherings as seekers. They would ask the Prophet some of stuff. They would uh, you know, come to that gathering in need of something, whatever they may be in a state of need or a state of seeking. It's very curious. It's related that they would leave essentially as guides. They would leave as people with their cups filled. They would come as seekers, but they would lead uh, leave as guides. And adding on to this, um, Hassan uh, had uh, related as well that uh, I continued to ask my father about, you know, how the Prophet ﷺ not just had these gatherings and what was the conduct of the gatherings, but how did the Prophet ﷺ conduct himself? What did he do in these gatherings? And Ali responds that Allah's messenger was always good humored. He was easygoing. He was mild mannered. He wasn't rude, nor was he coarse. He wasn't boisterous, nor was he obscene. He was not slanderous, nor was he someone who would try and find a fault that he comes to the gathering and he's trying to, you know, read the room and see who's not on par with his expectations. He, you, you see the psychology of this person that comes into a gathering and says, I'll sit wherever I can find a space. Even if it's not a big space, I'll just, I'm just going to try and find that space. This is not someone who comes into a gathering expecting a red carpet laid out for them, expecting for people to get out, get up for them. This is a person just coming and, and trying to, uh, you know, find the best in what, what already is and to bring benefit to what is already there. So he wouldn't look for anything in the negative. He would take no interest in what he did not desire. And he would not leave anyone who pleaded with him helpless, hopeless, or disappointed. Anybody that could come to him, even knowing that the Prophet was not someone who's super wealthy, that he's not somebody who's super rich or super well-resourced, but he was a prophet of Allah that nobody would come to him except they would feel that their need has been met. So even if it was just a good word, even if it's just a promise, or even if something positive, the Prophet would be someone to offer that. Oftentimes we see this, and I, I, I was at the uh, prison today where I was doing the Jummah khutbah, and I reflected on this, that a lot of times we come to an intersection and we see a homeless person and we see that person come and uh, say, just asking us for a dollar or 25 cents or just asking us for something. Oftentimes we don't have something, but maybe if we do, we give it to them and we may pat ourselves on the back saying, hey, we did something good and then we leave. But just thinking about was their need necessarily met? Did we meet what their inner need was, what their state was? But they'll still be homeless. You know, they'll still be in that space uh, where, where they are going to be in perpetual need. Uh, but when people came to the Prophet Sallallahu their needs were satisfied, even if he didn't have money to fulfill that obligation, he would give them something, he would help provide them something that would make them feel that their need is satisfied. So, you know, money can't always buy that. So what, what else can we offer in those spaces? And what the Prophet Sallallahu example shows us is that it doesn't have to be necessarily money, just being present to somebody, listen to somebody's story, talk to somebody. If it's a homeless person out in the 100 degree heat, why can't we just give him a ride? Is that not a human being uh, who needs to get to where they're going as well? So, you know, what, what's stopping us there? And just thinking about not just if you were to do it and what's the shortcoming that, that we experience, but what would the Prophet Sallallahu do? Literally WWMD, what would the Prophet Sallallahu do in, in, in these spaces? And uh, Ali lifts up as well that in these gatherings, there were three things that the Prophet ﷺ avoided, hypocrisy, excess, and that which did not concern him. The Prophet ﷺ minded his own business. He was not a gossiper. He was not a backbiter. And we see uh, very powerfully in the Islamic tradition how backbiting, how gossiping is talked about. That is, it is, it is, is something that is completely forbidden. It's something that is, is seen as almost you know, disgusting. It's something that's abhorrent. Um, but the Prophet ﷺ didn't even go to that length. He just didn't, um, he didn't concern himself with that which, which didn't concern him. He would, he would give people their privacy. He would not blame someone. He would not find fault with anybody uh, and, and go find their fault. And he wouldn't try to invade people's privacy. And he would advise his companions, don't go and try and uh, you know, violate the privacy of other people. Don't go and try and seek people's faults. He would teach people this. He would only utter that which for which he hoped to earn a reward. So he wouldn't talk out of turn. He wouldn't just go into a space and dominate it. But when he would speak, his companions would lower their heads in silence as if birds had landed on their heads. And only uh, when he fell silent 
uh, would they speak? So he was not someone, again, thinking the psychology who comes into a space that is you know, more, than, uh, more than legitimate to be his. Uh, but he doesn't come into a space thinking that he owns it. He sits down. He doesn't speak into the space thinking that uh, he, he you know, can monopolize it or that uh, he deserves the microphone and deserves to just keep talking. He would only speak when it would concern him. He would only speak when uh, it would necessitate. Otherwise, he would share that space with other people. The Prophet ﷺ would also be somebody where the people around him uh, would not contest another, one another's right to speak in his presence, that when, uh, when someone spoke in his presence, they listened to that person until they finished. So again, we talked about uh, in the earlier description of the gathering, people's voices weren't raised. It wasn't a competition to say, Prophet ﷺ, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. No, people gave each other respect. So they were in a group, they were as if they were equal, and everybody was given their appropriate time to speak. And when someone was speaking, nobody would interrupt that person. Uh, and their speech in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ, was also that which was the best of them. He would laugh about whatever they laughed about. He would marvel at whatever they marveled at. And he used to exercise patience with a stranger's rough manner of speaking or making inquiries, even if the uh, companions were keen to uh, kind of differ in that. And, and so, you know, he said that if you find somebody seeking something that they need, you've got to help them. Oftentimes we see this in the Sirah where people, whether they're Bedouins or people who are from a foreign land, they come to uh, the, the gatherings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they aren't familiar with what are the norms. They're not familiar with uh, what, what is the proper protocol around the Prophet and they speak out of order. They may speak how we perceive as rude and the companions rightfully so probably are just like, what, what is this guy doing? Like, why, why is this happening? This is not the way to talk to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would allow them to finish their speech and then he would communicate to them. There's a famous example. It's not necessarily in a gathering, but you have the example of the Bedouin man that walked into the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, goes to the corner and starts urinating. And, you know, this is, this is, at, this is in a conversation by any means, but this is him, you know, filling his, uh, his, his human biological need, but he's doing it in the masjid. And rightfully so, the companions, you know, get, get really angered and really intense and they rush to go and stop him. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, hey, hold up, hold up, let him finish. Let him finish. And, 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 and just to think about that, in our masjids today, we put our shoes on the carpet on accident. We put our shoes where not. We, we probably aren't welcome back uh, in there. But this person was uh, urinating in the masjid of the Prophet And, you know, he, he gets this reaction. And the Prophet lets the person finish. And then he talks to that person. He meets that person where he is. He's like, hey, this is a, a house of God. This is, this is we, we don't do that here. But he doesn't chase that person away because he knows that a person's first impression is so important. A first impression of Islam is so important that Islam is not something that drives people away, even if they come into it stumbling and, and, and bumbling. But he, he, he meets people where they are. He doesn't want to give them that impression that their first expression or their first impression of Islam, they just enter the masjid of the house, is that they get beat up and they get you know, tossed to the side, that they, they were met with compassion. And that, that just thinking about the psychology that informs not just the gatherings of the Prophet but his interactions with everybody, especially in the manner of speaking to strangers. So we have people that will probably come stay with us. We probably have people who are strangers that are passerbys and they may speak in different dialects, different accents or different ways of talking. And it may come across as insult to us. But thinking about, again, how would the Prophet Sallallahu deal with it? We are a very kind of uh, jumping to conclusion society. We will, we will uh, immediately react to something, but do we ever give that space? And, and think about that time where a stranger comes to the Prophet Sallallahu and maybe says some things out of order. His reaction is not like, well, let me, let me clarify this at all. Let me, let me get you on the same page, or how dare you say something like that? The Prophet Sallallahu lets that person finish their speech, and then he responds to them. The Prophet ﷺ would not, uh, and going back to what Ali is relating, that he would not accept praise from anyone except for someone who was responding to a favor which was given. And he would not interrupt somebody who was speaking until that person maybe transgressed or said something that was out of order. And in which case, if he did, the Prophet ﷺ would interrupt that person with either a mild prohibition or by standing up. So thinking as well. Somebody comes to the gathering, somebody comes to this gathering of knowledge, of patience, of just, you know, good, good sheer uh, talk that, that is just, that's, that's good halal conversation that's happening, and maybe says something out of line, or maybe says something that's there. The Prophet doesn't make that person a pariah. That Prophet doesn't make that person feel ostracized. The Prophet gently reminds that person that, hey, this isn't something that we talk about in a gentle way, so that person doesn't feel terrible, but also the Prophet sometimes would just stand up 
He would he wouldn't want to make that person feel bad. He would stand up. Imagine you're sitting in a gathering with the Prophet. So some, somebody's talking about something that's kind of, you know, a little bit of a weird, uh, you know, slippery slope type of topic. And the Prophet just stands up. The attention immediately diverts uh, to what this uh, what the Prophet some needs. So again, just thinking of his way of diverting a conversation, of steering it, doesn't make anybody feel bad, doesn't make someone feel like uh, they they have done um, you know something that that they're that's um, you know irreparable that they are somebody that is honored regardless of the mistake that they made but he still conveys it in a respectful way so this was the gathering of how the Prophet ﷺ was and we're going to transition a little bit to let's say that we finished this gathering and we're going to walk with the Prophet ﷺ to continue to observe his character but again some takeaways from how the Prophet ﷺ was in these gatherings you see this is a person of moderation this is a person who people recognized and who was the Prophet of Allah yet he did not have an expectation to be always given the mic or that he when someone is speaking he has the right to speak over them or that he has the right to take his place in a gathering or he has the right to do whatever he wants in these gatherings the prophet some gave everyone their respective agency even if they didn't know the rules of the space even if they may have made a mistake even if they had a lapse in judgment or whatnot and he would gently correct that uh, that lapse and be able to direct it without people feeling bad, without people feeling their humanity has kind of been hit at. He, he would uh, navigate this conversation much like a shepherd. Uh, he would not uh, you know, navigate it in a way where he feels he needs to demand. Remember, a shepherd is, uh, by function, someone that that not just shepherds uh, sheep or, or, or a flock, but shepherds them from behind, he doesn't go into the front, that he walks alongside or she walks alongside uh, that, that which is their flock. And so thinking how the Prophet as uh, a prophet, as a human being operated, that he was not someone who, as rightfully so, as, as the, uh, you know, the uh, the the uh, the the, rev uh, the bearer of revelation, the prophet of Allah, the messenger of Allah, has the right to convey and and to have that space. That he didn't exercise that that absolute power that was absolutely his did not corrupt him at all. That it, it kept him humble, and and he showed this example to us not just in a sense of oh, this is one person who just stands out and we can never achieve any of that. There's a reason the Prophet ﷺ was sent to us as the uh, Uswatun Hasana, that uh, in a good example, in a perfect example, that in the Prophet ﷺ, we have someone who's a model for all of us, for all of creation to follow. And uh, if we can't find something relatable in this, if we can't find hope within this, there's, there's maybe that disconnect. But in each of these things, it shouldn't just tell us that, oh, that was the Prophet ﷺ, so we can't do that. But these are very practical things that each of us can aspire to. We probably Probably won't get to do it as well or to that level of the Prophet ﷺ, but even changing how we interact in our society today, just to be present with people, just to honor certain people, just to change our demeanor a little bit goes a long way. Uh, just think about the society we live in where we are very trigger friendly with respect to how we judge somebody, how we may jump to some conclusions, how we treat the people who are, treat people who are different than us. Um, and just think about how the slightest adjustment, slightest recalibration to that type of thinking would do for not just our shared humanity, but just for our respect for one another. The Prophet ﷺ was narrated as when he would leave home. Again, thinking about it, he's in the gathering, we've gotten up, now we're walking outside to uh, go conduct some other matters. The Prophet ﷺ, when he would leave his home, he would hold his blessed tongue from speaking about anything except that which would concern him. He would be someone who brings people together and not cause them to scatter. He would inquire about his companions when they were not around, and he would ask about the general welfare of others. He would praise what is beautiful and strengthen it and condemn what is negative and ugly and weaken it. His was a balanced course, and he never swerved from one extreme to another. Again, very important to note, he was the same person that walked into that gathering and who was around his friends as he was outside the house, that he was a consistent person. He was not someone who would go to extremes and you know, to, uh, to divide up the people or who people felt that they would have to be split up in different spaces. He was somebody that people, regardless if they didn't get along, could feel that in the Prophet ﷺ, they had a unifier. They had somebody that they could come together with. They had somebody who would bring them together regardless of their difference, that he was somebody who would also, because of the fact, thinking again, this is the prophet of Allah. This is someone who has these conversations uh, with Jibreel. This is someone who's bearing that weight of revelation, and not just the weight of revelation, but thinking about 
all the different traumas this person has faced in their life. They're an orphan. They have lost you know, their buried children. They've buried their wives. They've had so much trauma. They've had to leave their home, all these different things and have to shepherd an entire community. The Prophet still is someone that would go out and ask about his companions, ask about the people who were not around. How are they doing? Checking up on people and asking about the general welfare of others. There's the famous story in, in Mecca when, in the early days of Islam where the Prophet would take a familiar route and a woman would uh, who, who was opposed to the Prophet would consistently throw trash on him that every time she saw him she would throw some trash on him and the one day she didn't throw trash he would go back he went to her house and says no, is everything all right like are you okay just thinking about that type of thinking doesn't exist in our society we, we don't when we when we see someone who is belligerent against us who may be harming us or maybe saying something to us once they may go away we may you know say alhamdulillah that person is completely gone be like you know i hope that person like has met that whatever kind of end that they've met or we think some negative thoughts but just think about the psychology of the prophet Sallam, that even to his enemies even to the people who hated him, he had this kind of a concern and a welfare for that. His humanity was not taken away when their humanity was stripped away, that when they would leave uh, all kind of just sensibility of humanity, that he still retained his and even more so. And so if he treated people who treated him negatively like this, imagine how his conduct would be to people who uh, gave him uh, a, a, the reciprocity of love and affection and uh, would accept his message and, and people who followed in his community. Just think about that, but also don't discount how he treated other people who were different from him or people who were opposed to him. He still honored their humanity and he still was concerned with their welfare. Uh, Anas ibn Malik relates that the Prophet had also uh, did not have a uh, an ounce of arrogance within him, that he was somebody, regardless of being the leader of the community, despite the fact that people would come to him for every single thing and he would be a high demand person, he lifted up that if a sheep's or a goat's trotter or uh, you know their hoof was given to me, that I would receive it. And if I were invited to eat it at someone's home, I would accept the invitation. He wouldn't see the, uh, the invitations of either slaves or noble people or servants or whatnot as something beneath him. He wouldn't rank them in, in any kind of aspect. So again, thinking to the aspect of classism as well, the Prophet ﷺ did not just come for a theological revolution, did not just come to tell them your God is one and uh, not these multiple gods. He also brought about a social revolution. He brought about a socio-political, socio-economic revolution that says this is how you treat each other, regardless of what your theology is, you shouldn't have these kinds of relationships where you abuse women, you abuse orphans, you, uh, you know, take advantage of people who are uh, your, your servants or your workers or whatnot. And so th this was as much a part of his uh, teachings as much as the theological aspect of it. And so thinking about when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is lifting up to people who would maybe be uh, of a more noble lineage or consider themselves of a, of a higher tribe or whatever they may be, that if they receive invitations, they see it as beneath them to go to this person's house or whatnot. And he's trying to foster this element of uh, camaraderie, of brotherhood and sisterhood within the Muslim community and lifting up by his own example that if even I was given like the hoof of a, of a sheep or the trotter of a sheep um, in the South Asian culture, you know, we have by that there's not much to eat from it, but there's just a little bit that's in the bone or there's a little bit that's there. Even if I was given something that was like a trotter, I would receive it. And if I was uh, invited to eat it, I would come and eat it and I would accept it. Uh, and, and showing that that humility is absolutely necessary. If you are not a humble person, if you are not someone who uh, can at least see someone and, and, and without kind of that arrogance or has have that arrogance, what is your faith for? You know, what, what, it, what, what good is your theology? What good is your Islam? You say that Allah is one. I follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but you still see other people as beneath you. You know, what, what, what good is Islam doing for you if, that, if, you're, if you're still having those kinds of thoughts? And so thinking about who the Prophet Sallallahu was, he wasn't just someone coming and saying, hey, here's this, here's, he's not just a theologian. He was someone who was showing how to practically live, not just as a community, but as humanity. Uh, a, a group had, and this kind of talks about in this next sense, when we talk about uh, this other narration that was presented by Zayd ibn Thabit, another Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ, that a group entered the presence of Zayd ibn Thabit and said to him that, relate to us the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, what, what should I relate to you? What, what, what all should I tell you? He was a Sahaba, he has so many. He was like, I was his neighbor. So when the revelation descended upon the Prophet ﷺ, he notified me and I recorded it in writing for him. But when we talked about this world, the Prophet ﷺ would talk about it with us. When we talked about the hereafter, the Prophet ﷺ would talk about it with us. We talked about food, he would talk about it with us. Showing you the Prophet ﷺ was not someone who was out of touch with his society. He was not out of touch with his community or the needs of his community. He wasn't out of touch with his own humanity. Oftentimes we see that, oh, in order to be the best Muslim I can or the most perfect Muslim, I have to shed 
all kind of uh, attachment to this dunya, and I just need to, you know, bury myself in, uh, in, in, in the, in the religion, in, in the Quran, in the Sunnah, and all this, and just, you know, forget all of these things and any kind of connection. But you see, the Prophet was someone of moderation. The Prophet being the person who conveyed all these things, being the person who worshipped as much as he did, who uh, remembered Allah as much as he did, who did all these things, was still somebody that people found relatable. That hey, Prophet I, I like this dish. It'd probably be like, yeah, I like it too. Like, you know, just be able to converse with people, meet them where they're at. Out, but also being able to talk to them about their religious matters, about their concerns. So having this balanced approach where people felt that they could go to the Prophet and they can have these conversations and not be as we have so many times in our community now where we feel like we can't have some of those positive conversations just about this world because if it's not about religion, if it's not about this, then it's not an important conversation. And just seeing how the Prophet probably used each of these conversations about the most mundane things to leave positive examples. And in when we talk about food, maybe that's one of those conversations that came up that somebody probably was asking him that, you know, uh, I, I like going to dinner, but like if somebody asks me to come and they all they have is this, I probably don't like it. And the Prophet some lifting up and said, no, like, you know, if you're offered something as simple as this, I would take it like, you know, you should accept that invitation. So using these moments of these, these very mundane conversations, these worldly conversations, but to use them for a purpose to help improve humanity. Again, thinking that there wasn't idle talk happening with the Prophet some there's intentional talk, but that intentional talk can happen with so many things, but they were very much in, in connection with the matters that were going around with them as much as they were with the matters of faith. So they're, but they had a balance in sense. And so they weren't lost in one or the other, but they struck that balance. Um, the Prophet uh, was also related by uh, Ahmed ibn al-As who said that the Prophet used to speak directly with the worst of people, thereby winning their hearts and talking a little bit about what we had mentioned in the gatherings. He used to do the same with me. And so, so much so that I thought I was the best of people. And uh, Ahmed relates later in the narration, I would ask him, Prophet who's, who's your favorite person? Like, who's your most beloved? And he went on the list, you know, saying Abu Bakr and then, you know, saying Aisha and like, you know, going going down the line. And uh, Ahmed ibn al-As finally got the cue that, okay, I'm not on that list. But he was like, I'm afraid to ask where where I am. But he had felt such a degree. Ahmed ibn al-As came to Islam much later than, anybody, than uh, a lot of the other Sahaba. But he was somebody who felt that because of how the Prophet would, would be with him, be present with him, honor him, talk with him, joke with him, meet him where he was and help change his heart, that he was the most beloved to us. Nobody could feel that way. But that just tells you how this person was intentional with people. He didn't pay them off and say, hey, love me, or hey, you know, I've got this great message, like, you know, follow me and you'll have all these things. He could genuinely connect with people. You see this in our time today where people will start religious movements and promise, you know, things that are very flat, or they will just take people's money and they will uh, establish a very fake kind of trust. And they may not even have a connection to who that person is. But the Prophet was someone that was not after any of that. He, he along with this person that who took bayah at his hands, who said, I will follow you. Uh, he wanted to get to know the person and he honored that person such a degree, they felt that kind of a love. Uh, another hadith is narrated by Anas ibn Malik, that said that I served Allah's messenger for 10 years. 10 years I worked in his home and he never once said oof to me. Oof kind of being an expression of displeasure or just you know some kind of uh, a statement you can probably relate in our times when you have a displeasure or you shout at something or you yell something uh, that, that you get angry and you shout that, that he never said oof to me. He never asked me about something that I had done saying that, why did you do it? Or he didn't ask me something about I left undone saying, why did you leave it undone? He was not a micromanager. Allah's messenger was the finest of human beings in character. That the Prophet exactly how he was in these gatherings, exactly how he was out with the people, he was the person inside the house. And who better to know than the people who were in his house? This person, Anas ibn Malik, spent 10 years as uh, someone who his parents had sent, said, hey, go help the Prophet Sallallahu You know, he's he's uh, not just the Prophet, but he's also getting older. So help him with the various needs. And it's reported that amongst these things, Anas would also be given tasks. And being a kid, like, you know, he goes out, he sees other kids playing, he goes and starts playing with the kids. And after a while, the Prophet Sallallahu will come behind him and maybe pick him up or just start to pull his ears and say, where, you know, where, where, where did you go when, when, when I sent you that task? And he, he's, he's playing with these kids. He's playing with this person, but he doesn't, you know, treat him how we may uh, see in our own lives, whether our parents or we as parents may treat our kids with respect to uh, this kind of discipline or this kind of uh, very kind of strict type of way of doing it or micromanaging. The Prophet was someone, someone who, uh, you know, lifted up children and made them feel loved and did not make them feel that they were lower than him. Uh, you, you see uh, in the hadith of the Prophet that 
The person who does not give honor to our elders or show mercy to our youth is not among us. So just seeing that this, as important as it is to give respect to the elders, it's just as important to give that compassion to youth in the process of with someone who lived what he practiced. But we see from these narrations that he was a consistent human being, that what people saw on the outside, they don't, they, they saw his people on the inside also experience that as well. We see this a lot of times uh, to the contrary with many religious leaders in our time, many in the Muslim community as well. They'll do give great sermons they'll do perfect things uh, on the outside but behind the scenes they're 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 uh sheep wolves and sheep clothing that they they do tremendous and horrible things um within their within their scope but on the outside it looks great on the inside it, it it's it's a very much of a different story and so you see for the prophet some what these narrations should tell us this person lived a very consistent life that they he lived a life as he walked outside and sat with his uh, companions as he did with all other people, met with strangers, met with his family, met with close friends. It was consistent. It wasn't any uh, interruption in that. Aisha, the wife of the Prophet narrated that Allah's messenger was neither obscene nor lewd in his behavior or his disposition, nor was he boisterous in the markets, and he would not repay a misdeed with a misdeed, but he would pardon and forgive again thinking about what people are seeing in the inside and what people are relating on the outside, they're very much the same. And Aisha continues to say, and this is very important, that Allah's messenger's hand never struck anything unless it was in the struggle in the cause of Allah. It was in jihad or in warfare, nor did he ever strike a servant or a woman. Thinking about the psychology, again, this is a person who was born in a very hyper-masculine society, a very toxic masculine society that obviously you know put uh you know the the male gender at a pedestal and and put men at the top and uh at, at the of the social ladder women were not so much even on it and then you know even adding to this uh, strata of social hierarchy. You have people who are enslaved or of different, different, you know, ethnicities or whatnot that are at the bottom if they're not at certain tribal affiliations or of certain ethnicity. And so the Prophet showing them by uh, as modeling as a man, modeling the person who is at the forefront of the community, regardless of all of his masculine features, the, the, the most striking of them as well in the society being he never struck anybody or anything, um, especially a woman or a servant, that he never let his temper get the best of him to where he would get into a fight with somebody to that extent, or that he would uh, hit somebody who was weaker than him or who someone who was seen as beneath him, that he would he would withhold that. So when we ask about, we sometimes see this in our mosque where people ask, you know, are we allowed to kind of hit our wives? Are we allowed to hit this? You, you just see how did the Prophet some deal with this? This shouldn't even be a conversation. How the Prophet some operated is he was the walking Quran, you know, if, and if you feel the, the, the gray area Area to go, you know, do some kind of harm. There, there's, there's not an issue so much with the faith. There's an issue with you uh, and, and how you're interpreting it. And seeing how the Prophet was that he's, he's, he's redoing how people had understood that or how they had kind of come to the uh, understanding of this is how men relate and this is how women relate. But to undo a bit of that thinking, and we see in the last uh, hadith that we talked about last time that when the uh, people came up to the, to Aisha radiallahu anha and said that, hey, what does the Prophet do in uh, in his home? Like, you know, we know what he's doing out here, but what does he do in his home? Thinking that they could, you know, get a lot of, uh, you know, spiritual benefit from that. And she said that he was a man among men. He was a, he was an ordinary man. He was a man among men that he would stitch his clothes. He would milk his goat and he would prepare his food. What else do you want to hear? That you see this 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 type of uh, understanding that the Prophet ﷺ was someone who uh, was not of that same kind of uh, crop that people were like uh, that you would expect a man to be in that society where they would come they would think that they have uh, ownership of of the women or the servants in their home that everything needs to be done for them and they're the kings of the land he would be someone who would who would live that but also toil alongside and he would be someone who would lead by even the most subtle things when we say striking a woman or a servant thinking about the implications not just from a practical basis, but socio, uh, sociologically, what did that happen? What did that uh, result in with respect to his society? What did that say about him? Aisha also uh, relates that I never saw the Prophet ﷺ take revenge for an outrage committed against him as long as none of the sacred prohibitions of Allah were violated. But if there's any violation of the sacred prohibitions, he would get angry. He would be upset that he, he was someone that had a full scale of emotions and he did get angry. But whenever he was given a choice between the two matters, he would choose the easier of two provided that it would not be conducive to sin. So seeing the Prophet ﷺ was somebody who would get angry, but at legitimate things. He would not just get angry for the sake of getting angry or for the sake of uh, you know, yelling at people or, or because he didn't get his way. He would get angry if matters of Allah were transgressed and, and for things that, uh, that merited that. Uh, another Sahaba 
Jabir ibn Abdullah says that never did the Prophet once say no to anyone who requested something of, of him. So thinking that this is a person who is approachable by anybody, a stranger who met him for the first time, or somebody who grew up with him as a kid, that never was he say, to say no to anybody, but also understanding that they knew the Prophet was not the wealthiest person. They knew this person was living very much on the poverty line. This person did not have a lot of material resources, yet people felt that they could come to him and ask a need of them. And he would never uh, leave them making making them feel as if their need was not addressed. Um, Umar ibn al-Khattab had lifted up as well, kind of going in along with this line of asking for some things, that a man came to the Prophet a man came and asked him to give him a gift. And so the Prophet said that, I have nothing right now, I have nothing at my disposal, but purchase something and say that it was, uh, it's, it's, it's permitted by me, that it's, uh, it's at my expense, so I'm giving you a credit basically, and when something uh, comes to me, I will settle that debt with whoever you had, uh, you had purchased this from. And then Omar, being who Omar is, the you know the person who knows about right and wrong and 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 is quick to quick to jumping with the anger, says that uh, oh messenger of Allah, I have given it to him, so Allah has not burdened you with uh, anything which is beyond your means. And so basically saying I've taken care of it. Don't 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 worry about this. And uh, the Prophet disapproved of what Omar said. He said that uh, a man of the Ansar then had said that oh Prophet of God give and don't fear any kind of impoverishment from the Lord of the throne. And Allah's messenger had smiled, the Prophet smiled, and it was clear from the look on his face that he was pleased with that Ansari's words and said, this is what I have been commanded for, that even if I was not able to provide it immediately, but I, I'm not here to uh, reject anybody's needs. I'm here to try and fulfill them. And even if I can't immediately, I, I, I do not fear impoverishment from uh, in this world. I do not fear um, you know, any, anything that Allah does not ordain for me. And so the process of giving this, giving this lesson as well to us, that sometimes we feel that we can't sacrifice financially. We can't give something financially or uh, you know, any practically because it may take away from us with the process of lifting up that this is a this is an amana. Everything we've been given is a trust from Allah. And so, what can we do to um, to not just advance that, but thinking that this is what the Prophet ﷺ was sent to do? Who 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 am I? This isn't my wealth. This is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's blessings. And what 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 are we going to say except that we had given what was given to us? Uh, Aisha radiallahu anha also relates that the Prophet ﷺ was someone who used to accept gifts, not just giving gifts. He would accept gifts, but he would provide a recompense of greater value. She lifted up an example where people had brought. Uh, some dates and some small cucumbers for the Prophet ﷺ, and he returned it with some small bits of gold and jewelry that he had in his home. So just thinking in our society, and maybe a little bit in that society as well, there's probably a little bit more parity there than there was here, but just thinking somebody brings you some, uh, some sustenance and nourishment uh, but you you get a return, you get some gold and you get some jewelry. So in our times, it's it's much more you know disproportionate. But in that times, maybe a little bit more uh, a little bit more equal, just because of the value of certain things. But just thinking about just the, the difference of the Prophet when he would be given a gift, he would always return uh, a gift with, or he would always give them uh, a recompense of something that was even better. So don't 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 think of it as the Prophet as somebody who would give back a gift or somebody who would just uh, you know give it away or anything like that he would he'd be honored by these gifts but also he felt the need to give people something of better measure um but what's really interesting we're talking about the subject of masculinity we're talking about how uh, how masculinity kind of function in society and thinking about again think of the people who we've talked about uh or who we've maybe have heard about in our um uh, previous readings and 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 you know sunday school readings of the sira and uh, a lot of the masculine um kind of you know uh, toxic masculine uh features that that are out there and listen to this narration by abu Sa'id al-khudri he says that the prophet was someone who was more bashful than a virgin in her quarters and that when he disapproved of something we knew it from the expression on his face that this is the prophet this is a person who's come to seventh century arabia where there are certain expectations of not who a man is but what a man is and uh, being someone who was orphaned he already uh was was kind of handicapped in that in that aspect from their their view they didn't see him as someone who was of legitimate lineage he didn't even have a father he couldn't have you know the, he didn't even have any male offspring you know what all these different things that were dinged against him you know the, the odds were stacked against him but even the fact that he became the leader of this community he he was someone who people looked at as a father he was someone who people would see uh, at that top as the, as the paragon of uh, of not masculine values but the paragon of human values he was someone who was still shy he was someone who was who was not you know looking to uh, express himself in, in a way to put himself out there or to own and dominate a space he was someone who was shy 
He was someone who, you know, just uh, was, was not uh, a, a person who would uh, suck out the space or suck out the air in a room. He would be someone that would be very modest and very shy. And just the, the comparison that you see in, in context of that time, uh, a virgin in her quarters that you have, um, someone who's like a shy bride in a sense. And you see the process of someone, someone who's more bashful. In his everyday character, uh, we related that he was someone who would uh, lower his gaze more often than he would look up in the sky, that he's somebody who would just be a very bashful, modest person. But he was someone who, when he disapproved of something, we would know it because he would show displeasure in his face. He wouldn't shame anybody. He wouldn't put make anybody feel like they're outside. But he was somebody who, from his expression, that you know that something is, is off. Um, and Abu Sa'id also relates that when Allah's messenger donned a new garment, just thinking about this modesty, this aspect of the Prophet that he's, uh, he's his character as well, he's very connected to his creator, he's very connected to Allah, that he would call the garment by its name. And then he would say, oh Allah, praise be to you, and you have clothed me with this garment. And he would name that garment with respect to if it's a shirt, if it's a turban, if it's, you know, uh, like an izhad, if it's something that just, that, that is uh, adorning him, that I beg you for its goodness and goodness of what it has been made for. And I take refuge from you, uh, with you from its evil and the evil of what it's had, what it's been made for. That such intentionality is given to a garment, a fabric, a piece of cloth. Think about if this kind of intention is kind of made, this kind of uh, dedication, this kind of respect is given for a sheet, think about the kind of respect this person has for other human beings, how he interacts with other human beings. The last few narrations we lift up go in line with this, that uh, one of the companions of the Prophet uh, Amr ibn Hurayt had related that, I saw the Messenger of, uh, of Allah praying one time, and he was praying in sandals that had new souls sewn into the old uh, into the old sandals. So again, thinking, what did Aisha say? That he's somebody, he comes home, he milks his goats, he stitches his clothing, he rep repairs his, his fabrics and his clothes, and then he goes and he prepares his food. That he lived exactly that. She wasn't just trying to build up her husband and say, oh, he does all this stuff. What does your husband do? Um, that she's building up all these different things. And you see companions notice that, that, hey, he's wearing really old shoes, but hey, they've got new soles sewn onto um, the, the old ones, that he's, he's repairing them. And, and it's related in another tradition that the Prophet would repair his own shoes, that this is somebody who's consistent across the board. He's not living a double life. He's someone who's very uh, consistent. Um, and then uh, we see the Prophet uh, his character in this aspect, uh, we, we close out with, uh, with the final hadith, and I hope that this can capture it, and then inshallah we can open it up for discussion or conversation. Again, you are welcome to use the chat or uh, welcome to unmute after we uh, conclude here and to give your thoughts. But the last thing, we related this last time, the Prophet was related by Umar al-Khattab uh, who said that, don't extol me as the Christians extolled the son of Mary that I am mer mer merely a servant. So say instead, not that I am the son of God or anything like that, say instead that he, the Prophet ﷺ, is Allah's servant, Abdullah, and that he is his messenger, Rasulullah. That you think about this person who at the end of his life, you know, has, uh, goes on pilgrimage, has thousands of people that uh, that you know, just honor him, that that venerate him in that aspect. But he warns them that don't do to to me what uh, other people have done in elevating a human people. That I am just a servant, and just call me that. And so, just think about not just his psychology as someone. When you think about what does power do to people, when you when, even if some of us, if we get a job promotion, if we get a higher salary, if we get some kind of upgrade, when we uh, you know went from students to people who are employees, just thinking about the power that you may get or you know, just all these different uh, differentials that come into play in the process of staying at that level that I'm, I'm just a servant, you know, I'm the person who, even if I have completed the revelation and completed the message, I'm still someone that will come into your gathering and I'll just find a place to seat. I don't need some way to distinguish my place. I won't speak over somebody else. I won't, you know, suck out the air. I will, I will speak only when it's my turn to speak. I will be this kind of a person who will speak there, that he was, he was somebody who would be able to be relatable. He would meet people where they were and he wouldn't uh, dishonor anybody or expect anything from anybody. Uh, and this applied to people who were against him and people who were for him. Uh, the last narration I had actually lifted up was just how the Prophet would sit. The Prophet would just, would be someone who you may expect that 
This person would come and he has a very dominating presence, but the Prophet some uh, people would see him in the mosque and he's sitting in what's called the uh, Qurfusa position, that when you're sitting, you kind of have your knees up to here and your hands are kind of around. So just a very relaxed position. People would see him you know, sitting very humbly, just like that, sitting very humbly. And uh, they would relate that we would see the Prophet some seeing in such a, such a humble and tranquil manner that we would tremble in awe, like this is the Prophet of Allah and he's just so calm. He's not expecting a throne or he's not you know, just making his space here that this is my mosque, I'm here. He's just sitting very humbly. His shoulders are closed. He's just sitting very humbly and that in gatherings, he would be somebody that you could walk in. He doesn't have to be standing up or he has, doesn't have to be sitting on a mantle, that he is somebody who is just reclining. He might be reclining on a cushion. He may be laying down, but he's someone who teaches like that. He's someone who he didn't eat when he reclined, but he would somebody who just would be able to be very easy going. You'd be able to have a conversation with him in these gatherings and not think that, oh my God, we're all on edge, the Prophet ﷺ would blend in to the company. And so uh, as we close out uh, our, our discussion of this and the session of this, uh, just think about what are the practical things? These are things that all of us can aspire to. We may not be able to achieve that same level of perfection that the Prophet ﷺ executed each two, but in each of these, at least what, what it tells us, the Prophet ﷺ was someone who's consistent across the board, private life, public life, social life, was the same person and was someone who treated everything with utmost respect, whether it was a fabric of garment, whether it was an animal, or whether it was another human being who liked him, who didn't like him, he treated everything with its due diligence because of the fact he was someone who was mindful of Allah, that all of this that's around us, this is all belonging to Allah. I am just someone who is uh, passing by, conveying a message, that's it, that I, 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 I'm not someone who, who will pass judgment on any of these things. I'm just someone who's Allah's messenger and I will do what I can in these space. So may Allah allow us to continue to walk in the footsteps of the Prophet, inshallah, next time. We're going to be going into the home of the Prophet. ﷺ. We will see how the Prophet ﷺ lived. What was the lifestyle like of the Prophet? ﷺ? We got a little bit of a hint of that um, from our mother Aisha, who related what the Prophet ﷺ did in his home, but we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more uh, about what uh, what the lifestyle was like of the Prophet ﷺ and his family. So, inshallah, we will conclude the uh, the uh, session with respect to the session material here. And I'd love to just kind of open it up for conversation with you all, uh, or if you'd like to just put it in the chat or in the comments, and we can go from there, inshallah. But Jazakallah for listening here. And I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts. What what kind of, uh, which hadith, which uh, narrations, which aspects of the Prophet ﷺ really stuck out to you? Which ones did you like? Which ones were you kind of confused about? Um, and we can kind of go from there. I'd love to hear your reflections. So Jazakallah khair, inshallah, till next time. For our session, we'll we'll talk uh, next Friday, but we'll open it up now. <laughs>